of Numbers, if you haven't already, if you'd open to that, we are just getting ready to pull out of Leviticus and finalizing that. I do want to go back and hit a couple of things in Leviticus uh, before we move on um, tonight as we think about this uh, new book that we're entering into in, in the Pentateuch, fourth book, and we're headed, we have one more, Deuteronomy. Um, Numbers, if you're reading through the book of Numbers, the chapters are long, lots of names in the book of Numbers. Easy to be, get bogged down reading those names. It'll really uh, test you on pronouncing some of those names. Don't you wish they had just simple names, Bob, Fred, Bill, Susan, you know, but a lot of these names are more uh, complicated than what we're used to hearing. Um, but it inter interests me that the Lord names people. Um, and it also it verifies to me God wrote the Bible. If you think about how that in history you can go back many times and they'll find where these, this city was actually here, these king was actually here, different things. It's like if these, you know, if people were so wise, it would be very easy to disprove the Bible. If you ever tried to do your genealogy, you find out how complicated that is to go back very many years. And look at the step back into time, into years. I don't know of any, any other book that's ever done anything like this that, you know, um, far as name the people and, and things. So I found it quite interesting uh, that in the book of Numbers also, we would see that um, numbers are important, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Before we leave the book of Numbers, though, I would like to bring up a couple of things. Uh, the main offerings that we discussed a little bit about the book of Levit Leviticus. And remember, the book of Levit Leviticus is about sacrifices. That was the key thing going on in, in the book of Leviticus, pointing towards one day Christ would become the supreme um, sacrifice. The four offerings, actually five offerings that we talked about, each had a significant of later in time. Uh, not only did it deal some, do, would do something with right then, but it was also prophetic of a, of a picture. For example, I'll give you these real quick. Um, when they did the, when they did the um, sin offering, we know that that is a direct picture where Christ becomes sin for us. And we need to have our sin covered. And of course, over and over and over in Leviticus and in, in these folks' life, you would see them over and over and over. I mean, there's many sacrifices. I mean, just hundreds of sacrifices they would see in their lifetime, reminding them that sin had to be paid for. Um, and I think in salvation and talking to people, there's this one guy, very popular on radio, um, national speaker, but he would just say, you say this prayer, you're saved. But it's not the prayer that saves. Right. It's the heart crying out to God and asking That's forgiveness right. that saves. And there's a vast difference in the fruit of that. Um, so understanding sin, though, is important. That something happened on the cross of Calvary that we became, we understand that he paid for our sin debt. Uh, he wasn't paying for his sin. He was paying for our sin and that we needed forgiveness of our condition that we're in. Then there was also the peace offering, which I found is quite an interesting offering. And that's understanding when you think about what is a peace offering. Well, where is peace in people's life? Peace comes with Jesus Christ. True and lasting peace. Um, in the middle of a storm, we can have peace. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Then there was also the meat offering. I just had one of those. I had meatloaf for dinner. Man, I like those meat offerings, but you know what I think about that? I don't know what, how you make your meatloaf, but my wife puts brown sugar on the top of that thing and lets it kind of melt on there. How many do that? Man, how can you go wrong with all that, you know? And just has a little bit, but aroma. It's not quite like homemade bread. That has its homemade. The Lord didn't have one of those offerings. I don't know why. I would call that manna from heaven, you know? But, uh, you know, there's a there's aroma to it. And they had a certain spice that they're only allowed to use and oils that they're only allowed to use um, for, the, for the offering. But that would, uh, that would be the meat offering. And that was a pleasing offering. And, you know, you think of meat, I think of food, I think of the smell, I think of something that uh, would be pleasing. The burnt offering, that was an offering. Of th it, it th you think about that, you think about Christ taking on our hell, and you think about complete sacrifice it took. 
It just didn't, he, he died on the cross. It took, it, and he had to stay on the cross. It took total commitment, complete sacrifice when you think of a burnt offering. They also had where they would exercise faith. It's, it would be underneath offerings. It's a little different. You don't think of it as an offering. But think about this. Every seventh year, they were supposed to leave their fields go. And that was an offering. And here's what it is. You think about all, but all your food comes out of that and your, and your sustaining ability comes out of the field and God says on the seventh year, I don't want you to mess with it. So what would you be living on for that year? I, I ha, you have to have my word and you have to say it in one word. What are you living on? God said something. You're obeying it. There's no grace. Be a good word. Not quite what I'm after yet. Who said faith? You say faith. That's right. Faith. That's what you're living on because you're, you're, you're trusting completely what God said. You're obeying it. You don't see it. <laughs> There's an empty field there. How are you going to sustain and feed your family? God says, I'll take care of it in the seventh year. You have to trust me. That's faith, is it not? You know, they, they did that with their manna every day. You cannot take and store up manna. It had to be, you go out and you pick it enough for the day and that's it. The only day you could pick more is the, it would be um, the day before uh, the Sabbath and it wouldn't spoil if you didn't. How many of you have ever thrown uh, garbage in the trash and you've neglected a little bit and man, it reeked. Um, well, that's what that that's what that manna would do. The same food you were eating the day before would reek if you tried to keep it and go against what God said. He is saying this: you're going to have to trust me for tomorrow's meal. Faith. So he's teaching them to live by faith. Um, and you know, I think about our fields today. We think we're smarter farmers, but I wonder if we haven't reeked all reaped what we've sown when we've taken all the good substance out of our soil. And foods and things today, uh, it's hard to eat right. And you think of what all they go in, especially if you start looking how how they just don't uh, let the field set today too much. And uh, so anyway, that uh, that relates to somewhat the offering. Now I wanted to talk just a little bit because it crosses over with a, a far jump into the book of Deuteronomy, which is our last book that we'll be looking at here in a, in a few weeks. But I want you to see again what God said, because Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 20, we spent so much time on sanctification there and why God judged them. But I thought I would give you a quick review from another book, which is Deuteronomy, which is a review of the law. And jump with me, keep your hand here in Numbers, jump with me to Deuteronomy chapter 9, and I just want to look at a couple of verses here. Since we're leaving the book, and God told them not to be like the people, and in reviewing before Moses leaves the scene and changes guard and gives the responsibility to Joshua and goes home to be with God, he reminds them of why God destroyed the people in Canaan and what they're not to do. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. It says this, it says, Speak not thou in thy, speak not thou in thy heart after that the Lord thy God has cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. So see, it's not because Israel's so good, so kind. It's because God's so good, so kind. But for the wickedness of these nations, that's why God drove those Canaanites out, their wickedness. The Lord does drive them out from before thee, not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thy heart, does thou go to possess their land? But for the wickedness, notice the little quote there, the little two marks. It's defining what's just been said. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform that word which the Lord swear unto thy father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Six, understanding therefore, Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. That's pretty plain, isn't it? 
You know what that would be good for? It shows that God was why God drove them out. It shows how God just set his love towards Israel. Um, but it also shows this. They weren't saved by their righteousness, which means you're not saved by works in the Old Testament. Amen. That's a pretty good doctor to think about. Then look at chapter 10 and verse 12. God summarizes it. And of course, we know Jesus Christ refers to this book in the New Testament when the lawyers and the Sadducees and the scribes put him on the spot and trying to trip him up on words, saying, what's the greatest commandment? And he goes back to the book of Deuteronomy. And it's one of these verses. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 says this. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God. I'll tell you, the right fear of God. Think of what the right fear of God would do again in America. We need a righteous fear of God again. Amen. Amen. Uh, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like uh, almost what the Lord said is a great commandment in the New Testament? Love thy neighbor as thyself is the second commandment. And that just shut him up. Well, I thought I'd give you just a little review because leaving that, that's what that's all about. When we get to the book of Numbers, how do we see Jesus in the book of Numbers? What's the greatest way we see it in the uh, Numbers? We see him as, as, as the brazen serpent in this book. And that would be Numbers chapter 21 if you're taking notes. Uh, that's, the, that's the greatest way we see him. And um, now when we think about that, they didn't know this, but we, got, we, we were left these illustrations as in samples, the Bible would say, in uh, 1 Corinthians. And so we look back on that brazen serpent. How does that show us Jesus Christ? Well, the, 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 you think about a you know, think about what the what got him in trouble. What got him into trouble? Say it in one word, a Bible word. Idolatry, disobedience. I'm still looking for another word. It was disobedience, but one word begins with M. Got him in a whole lot of trouble. Murmuring, that's right, got him in a lot of trouble. Is there anybody in here never murmured? You ever murmured under your breath? How many of you guys take out your garbage? How many, how many just ever, is there anybody that hasn't taken out garbage? Humbling job, take out garbage. How many have ever taken out garbage and murmured? This is a garbage job. I used to say, now it's not very much, I said, I, I can get you a job, $10 an hour and all the food you can eat. But that's not so anymore. It's probably a lot more now. But uh, anyway, the brazen serpent, Christ became sin for us. That's why the serpent is such a hideous thing. So that's how it symbolizes that. He became sin for us. And of course, the answer, the simple concluding answer of they murmured, but the cure was what? You can say it. You got to say it. You got to say it. My word. One word. And it begins with F. Who said it? Faith. That's right. Faith. What they had to do. Why? Why was faith the answer for their murmuring? Now you can have a sentence. What'd they do? Look and live. That's right. Remember what the God said? He made this is where the brazen serpent came from. He made it. They looked up. The serpents went, hey, by the way. Did he, he could have just told the serpents to go away. Did he do that? Nope. He didn't tell them to go away. They still bit them. But the cure for the bite was, look at the cross. Look at, this. all you got to do is look, which means this. Ready? Again, you're not saved by works. You're saved by grace. They didn't deserve a cure, but God gave them a cure. And the cure was this. All you have to do is look and live. And how are we saved today? We, we can't earn salvation, but we can receive salvation by faith. Amen. And so they didn't know all these. These, these examples had meaning and uh, that the Lord wanted to use and gave us these truths in these stories so that we could drive home our faith, the, the emphasis of it. It's a very uh, great book to think about. 
I uh, jumped ahead of this real quick. Some wanted to copy this. I left it up for one more week. This goes back to Leviticus. These are different things that we talked about uh, in, that, in that book. Um, so I'm just going to leave it up tonight. If you want to use that, you certainly can. Numbers. Go back to Numbers chapter 1. Let's read a couple verses and emphasize some things in this book. In verse 1, it says this, The Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. I mean, do you realize how much is said right there? <laughs> it pinpoints a lot of different things, the months, uh, the, you get a vicinity of when they're going to do all this. But also, you think of this. They've been wandering in a wilderness. They heard about one day they're gonna, it's going to come to an end. One day it's going to be over. We're going into the promised land. That day's coming. Uh -huh. And did it come? Yeah, this is the whole thing. Book of Numbers is lining it up, getting it ready to step into that day is coming. Now listen, one of these days we're getting out of here. Yeah. Have we been talking about it for a long time? Have we been wandering around looking for the one day when we go to the promised land into glory? Amen. One day it's going to happen, amen? Whether through the rapture or just through death, we're going to be out of here. Um, in verse 2 it says, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families. Now you're talking about two million people here now. You're not talking about an easy <laughs> count. But you know what they're going to do? They're going, to go, they're, going to name their, they're going to name the families. They're going to find out what tribes they belong to. They're going to name who's going to, what those tribes are. They're going to put together banners for that. They're going to uh, name leaders in charge of those banners. They're going to bring those leaders together with Moses. Moses is going to teach those leaders. Those leaders are going to teach their tribe people. They're going to have leaders of thousands. They're going to have leaders of hundreds. They're going to have leaders of 50. It's, it's, it, the idea, this is a book of numbers. God counting here, God's putting them together. God's going to tell us how big the army is. I'll give it to you here tonight. And in an estimate of how many children was in this group, all these things we take from the book of Numbers, God lists the names of the people who are going to be the heads of the tribes, list them, list who their father is, list who their heritage is. What kind of genealogy have you ever read that could step back hundreds of years and name everything like that? Doesn't that encourage you? We got an inspired Bible. Yes. Only God would have this kind of knowledge. Verse 2 says, Take the sum of all the congregation of the, of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male by their poles. And of course, many genealogies always followed the man. But you have at times exceptions to that and you have one of them in the book of Numbers. I won't talk about, but it's, uh, because it's not the major emphasis that I want to talk about, but it's interesting that it's given in the book of Numbers and what to do about that, to keep that family name going. Verse 3, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. 20 years and up. Now remember, those are also the ones that get to go into the promised land. It says, and with you shall be a, a man of every tribe, every one of the house of his fathers. And these are the names of the men that shall stand with you. And he begins to name all their names. So when I come to this, I don't skip the names. The reason is because if God put them down, then I'm going to read them. God thought that much of them. I should at least be able to read them. Amen. So I go through there and I, and I turn mine. I try to, you know, phonetically sound out those names best I can when, uh, when I read them. So give you a little idea of the beginning of the book. Um, this book would come in somewhere around 1415 B.C. <laughs> That's mind boggling, is it not? Uh, 1,400 years before Christ was born, we have a, a record, a genealogy of names of um, armies. All right, so tonight what we're getting basically is we're getting an introduction. Uh, go with me to chapter 11. Chapter 11. 
Chapter 11 and verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. When Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place tab Rah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? And um, just that their unbelief, over and over, murmuring was a problem, and their unbelief, after seeing and hearing these stories that were told and miracles that they seen every day that God would do in uh, getting them out and freeing them, <coughs> providing for them in a unique way in a desert place where you can't grow food or, you know, hard to find things. Um, God provided for a million people over and over and over. Now they get to a place where they're not happy. And God's not happy with their murmuring. Go to uh, chapter 14. And verse 2. And all the children of Israel, there it again, did what? Murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that uh, we had died in the wilderness? And notice the exclamation point. Basically, God gets upset. So up, up on our slides real quick, you see numbers, and numbers are important. And, uh, you know, numbers jammed up don't mean a whole lot. But when you begin to put numbers together and understand numbers, they begin to take on a significance. Like, uh, how many of you have alarm clock? You set alarm in the morning. And uh, how many of you, you know, it seems to just come too fast. You said that thing, an alarm, you think it can't be morning yet. Or how many of you ever decided to hit snooze and an hour went by? How many have ever let the second alarm just go and go and go? Anybody ever do that? No one raised their hand. Ah, one person raised their hand. Thank you for your honesty. God bless you. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so um, uh, we have numbers and they mean a lot. Now, when you get a paycheck, those numbers mean a whole lot. You worked 40 hours and got five bucks. What would you do? And so you might, you might want to go back and talk to them about those numbers. Um, what's this? What's this? What's happening here? He's complaining, that's right. He's complaining. And so, but have you ever thought that that could be you? That could be me? And so, I don't know, we probably all, sooner or later, get grumbly about something and we complain. And we really think about all the blessings that we have. We probably have very little to complain about. If you, if you left, if you took all the things that you just want and put in your front yard and left only what you needed in your house. Think of the blessings that you have. Now, some of you wives would hope that your husbands would do that one day, <laughs> probably. Get rid of some of those things, you know. But uh, God has been very, very good to us. Amen? Amen. And so we have a lot, mo lot more of our wants. Let me give you some numbers. Uh, go back with me, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Remember we talked about the, the men that are going to, uh, the 20 years old and up. These are the, this is going to be the army that's going to go in. These are, gonna, these are the guys that's going to do um, all the fighting. You know what God says? You know how many there's going to be? God says this. There's going to be 603,550 fighting men. I think that's, it's, it's in, that's in Numbers. Did I tell you Deuteronomy? Numbers chapter 1 and verse 46 gives us that exact number. Um, tells us about the 20, year, 20 years and older upward in verse 45. And in 40, verse 46, it gives us the exact number. I thought it was interesting. 603,550. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting number. But again, who would know that number? 
from 1,400 years ago. God put that thing down. Now, this is just guesstimation. Many of these numbers are given in, in here, but the guesstimation of from these numbers is that would mean that there was 400,000 women. There was 200,000 older men. There was 800,000 children. <laughs> That's quite a group. That's got to be an entertaining place. 800,000 children. 100,000 mixed multitudes. Where do mixed multitudes come from? Egypt. That's right. People who believed in the Lord God Jehovah, they believed in them. Um, I'm going to give you the cautions of this book. Was this right here? We've already emphasized the caution seems to be that I, a repetitive problem is murmuring. Even Moses got, one of the meekest men in the Bible, even Moses got angry. And what did it cost him? Going into the promised land. Now, how about the people who said, we can't go in? And they murmured against God and said, we got to go back to Egypt. Did they go in? No. Was there one of them that went in? Two went in. That's right, two went in. And who were they? Isn't that interesting that God named them, Joshua and Caleb? Those two went in. So again, if you're talking 1400 years, history verifies there was a Jericho, which was their first place. I've actually seen the foundation of Jericho in, in Israel. There was the place. <laughs> and so it's interesting that geologists can dig up these places 1,400 years ago, associate the kings and uh, the Moabites and all these places, the surrounding places that's all around there and describe them to the T, and here it's in the Bible. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty interesting proof text when you begin to look at the big picture. So let me ask you a question. When the spies went in, murmuring was a problem. When they came out, how did they affect the two million people? That's right, with their negativity. So let me ask you a question. Can complaining be contagious? So the lesson that we would learn from this, if we, were, we're just, if we just wanted to preach a message on it, we'd preach a message on grumbling can be contagious. You better be careful. Do you want to be the, um, the ten spies or do you want to be the two? And what did they almost do to the two that were positive? Stone them. You know I've had people mad at me because I'm happy. I'm not kidding you. They're mad at me because I'm happy. And uh, I know sometimes I'm happy in a sad mood. I want to be careful with that. I don't want to be goofy about the thing. Somebody's sad, you got to be careful with happiness. Right. Um, we've had times I've been in the hospital. I've told you this before, but I'll tell you. I've been at the hospital. Somebody's dying on the first floor. I mean, it's, there's mourning. There's weeping. I'm getting in an ele elevator, and I'm going up, and somebody's being born in the third floor. I can't take what I, what I have in my heart down here and <laughs> go up there, you know, yeah, this is the first day of their life. Today they start dying. I got to be, you got to be a little more positive, amen. Think about what parents, think about what goes into raising a child. That's pretty much going to wear somebody out, is it not? <laughs> uh, but we go into it happily, <laughs> maybe naive, but happily. But uh, it's, uh, you know, joy is not always what people want to, have. Sometimes people like to get other people complaining and grumbling with them. They want other people, yeah, 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 that's right. And somebody walks in and says, you know, really, we don't have anything to complain about. Oh, you don't stick out. You stick out as being a bad guy. Is your job's not so bad. I've been on jobs where people walked off those jobs because they didn't like it. And somebody else walked with them because they got, they, their spirit got contagious. And I was still in a good mood, and I was doing the same job. I was thankful to have a job, and I felt like God gave me that job. Yeah. Doubting, can it be disastrous? Yeah. Why is it disastrous in this story so far about murmuring that we learn about the people going in, spying out the land? Why was that disastrous? It's affected, even what we read today, it affected somebody. 
Who? The rest That's the rest of them. That's right, because in, before they went in, those ones who were negative, God said, you're not going in. And it was the biggest cemetery for 40 years. They buried that group, and it was their kids that are going in right now that were reading about it. This is the group that they said it would destroy our children. God says they're the ones who's going to go in, you're not. That negativity cost them going into promised land. Um, what about, and you can write this verse down, it's written in Deuteronomy 8.12, you don't have to turn there, but I, I'll tell you what it is, wandering can be humbling. <laughs> it can be humbling. Why are you wandering? We did this. We were negative. We were murmured. We, we blame God, if we're honest. Why are you in this kind of trouble? Well, my attitude. You know, people in jail sometimes they have a hard time admitting. There is, there is truth that in jail a lot of times nobody's guilty. I know we can get it wrong, but I don't think we get it wrong all that much. <laughs> as much as what people would say. But uh, um, wandering can be humbling. All right, I'm going to give you an outline, and that's all the further we're getting. I got a three-point thought on what God's focus is in the book of Numbers, and that's where we'll pick up uh, next week. But I want to give you the outline of the whole book real quick. From, from chapters 1 to 4, it's a look back. You get that idea already? We're looking back. We're looking back at... What cost them a problem? The idea is this. You're going to go into the promised land. Let's not do the whole thing over again. And I want to give you a warning. What cost them, Leviticus 20, the sin that they got into, if you guys do that, guess what? You're going to get thrown out of that land too. So a warning. Chapters 5 through 20 is a look within. Let's look at our own life. Let's think about our own life. Let's look inside of us. Are we negative? Are we, are we grumbling? Are we uh, complaining? Are we doubting? Are we humble? Chapters 27 through 30 is a look ahead. And it's about the promised land going in. And you know what we have? We have Moses being replaced by Joshua. We have Aaron being replaced by um, Eliezer, his son. We have Marian, Miriam dying along the way. We have a generation that's passed away. They've heard about the promised land. Now they're all going to go in. That God said those children, those are the ones you're worried about. They're the ones who's going to go in and claim the land. Now look ahead. We're about to do it. We're about to take that step. We're going to be going. It's going to happen quick. And these are, these are your new leaders. And it's about putting everybody in order. When they go in, they go in in order. And in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 14, God says to the church, he says, let everything be done decently and in order. And the, and the, the 1 Corinthians, the context is about a church service, yeah. preaching. It's about having order to it. I know you can get formal and you can get over orderly. But there's also, there's something about order that's also peaceful, some kind of order that we have to have. So just as God picked leaders then, somebody's going to have to lead. Somebody's going to have to follow. And it's up to God to decide who that is. I was talking to somebody today. They pretty much wanted me to tell them, what do you, what do you, what do you think God wants me to do? And they said to me, you know, somebody wouldn't tell them. And I said, very wisely they wouldn't tell you. I said, why not? I said, because they want God to tell you. <laughs> you need to get it from God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how, and I just told him how I got it from God. I begged him and begged him and begged him and begged him and begged him to find out what is it that God wants me to do. And that's what we need to uh, do. And then um, God calls, calls, calls leaders. He calls people to rise up. And then chapter 31 through 34 closes out the book. And it is a look up. It's a look up, a trust. And so uh, that's a great introduction, I hope, to this book. We covered a lot of it, uh, information here quick. Uh, then next week we'll get into some slides and some focus on seeing God 
uh, specific things about this book a little bit more as we kind of tunnel vision some of these things such as the brazen serpent. But uh, pretty much we've already talked about that uh, part of it that I want you to uh, kind of think about through this book. If you have questions uh, as we go through these books, please feel free to ask, especially why it's fresh on our minds and uh, things that would be helpful to you. Let's take a moment and go to our Lord in prayer here tonight, if you would, please.